السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد Always and forever we begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send our prayers of peace upon the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We testify with firmness and conviction that none is worthy of worship but Allah that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his worshipping slave and final messenger. I continually remind myself and you of taqwa Allah azza wa jal. And this is an inner awakening in the heart. It's a personal belief that we have in our being that I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it to manifest itself in the words we speak and in the conduct that we adhere with. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets that belief that we have within us be better than what we seek to portray to others publicly, Allahumma ameen. Uh, it is a great honor uh, and a privilege for me to be with my brothers and sisters here uh, at the University of Portsmouth. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of those who have uh, given an effort to be with me. I'm sorry that we were late a few minutes, uh, but London traffic is a killer, subhanAllah. We left London 2.20 and we arrived 6.30. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write it in your scale for waiting for us those few extra minutes. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you patience inshallah with that regard. Ma ajmala Muhammada. How beautiful is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is unlike any other man. He was blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with particularities and things that are unique to him. And one of the things that sets him aside from others, from all others in humanity, is what was called jawami' al-kalim. That he would be able to say something that was short in number of words, succinct, concise, but that its meaning and its comprehensiveness was vast that what he said had ramifications not just for those who lived with him then, but was applicable and applied and as timely as it is for us today and into the distant future. And when you look at the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which is the topic that was chosen for me to speak with you today, I want you to be able to feel him in your life. And when I talk about the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu it's not that I'm going to outnumber for you a number of hadith. He said this, 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 this. But I want us to get to connect with him a little bit more than just those paper connections. See, there's this misunderstanding at times amongst Muslims. And that, <coughs> excuse me, that misunderstanding amongst us leads to a misconstrued perception of the Prophet ﷺ amongst those who don't know him at all. And that misconception amongst us is that he was just a person who was there as a lawgiver. He told us, do this, don't do this. And if you do this, you get this. If you don't do this, you're going to get that. But the Prophet ﷺ transcended that. And I want you today to connect with the Prophet ﷺ on three different levels. First, I want you to see his teaching to those who believed in him. And I want to talk to you about his teaching to those who did not believe in him. And I want you to see his teaching to those who believe in him but have not seen him. You know, you and I are very unique people. Those of us who have come to choose the Prophet ﷺ and make him a part of our life in his modality, in his sunnah, that we try to embody what he taught us. 
We are the beloved of the Prophet ﷺ and the beloved of Allah. There's this, you know, and I begin with this hadith, there's this beautiful statement where the Prophet ﷺ was seen weeping by his companions. And they came and they said to him, what's wrong Ya Rasulullah? What, what's, ma yubkik? Why are you in anguish? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ahbabi, the ones I love, you know, I worry about them. And they said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, awalasna ahbabak, aren't we the ones you love? He said, antum ashabi, you accompany me. You know, you see me, you talk to me, when you have a problem, I can help you solve it. Ahbabi, the ones I love, the ones I cherish, the ones who are a part of me in my heart, are those who will believe in me. Alladheena yu'minuna bi wa lam yarawni and have not met me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore you and I, you know, when we visit Medina, I was in Medina two weeks ago, I, I just finished my Umrah. When you visit Medina, you know, you connect with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you, you know, you wander through his masjid, and you're like, oh, you know, he could have walked in this place, and you know, you go, you visit Uhud, and you see that little mountain, and where the battle of Uhud was, and you're like, wow, you know, which speck of this sand might have touched the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's almost like, it's, you know, it's like so far away, but so near, so vivid. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, although we were far away from him in time and place, we are so near to him and vivid to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his heart for us. Ahbabi, you know, he loves you. Peace and blessings be upon him. So I want to talk to you today about the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the essential teachings is the essence of our faith. And one of the brothers as I was coming in, he said, you know, I heard something about Islam and Muslims. And I really <coughs> want to make this a central discussion today. When people would come and ask the Prophet, as is in the famous hadith, you know, the hadith of Jibreel, there's also the hadith of a Bedouin man who comes and says to the Prophet Sallallahu what do I need to do to enter Jannah, to enter paradise, like to have salvation in the next life? And the Prophet simply said that you believe and bear witness that there is none that is worthy of worship except God, and that I am a messenger of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you establish the five daily prayers, you fast the month of Ramadan, you give from your charity, zakah, and you make hajj if you are able to perform it. That is Islam. But see, the thing that we at times forget is that there's a difference between Islam and Muslims. You know, isn't this what the whole, you know, all the controversy that you lead, read in the newspapers now today is, is that people commit acts as Muslims, but what is blamed is Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ from the very beginning sets a huge difference in that regard. And when you see the difference, it's actually, you know, subhanAllah, it's one of those points of Jawami al kalim it's a comprehensive statement. So what's Islam? Well, believe in God, believe in me, pray, fast, give charity, go to Hajj. And then you ask, what's a Muslim? And you would almost assume that the Prophet would say, a Muslim is the one who believes in God, fasts, prays, gives zakah. But that's not what he says, sallallahu alayhi wa He defines a Muslim not in terms of the relationship with Allah, but in terms of the relationship with other people. So he says, al-Muslim man salim al-Muslimoon min lisanihi wa yadi. The one who submits to God is the one who other Muslims find safety in that man, in that woman, from their tongue and their hand. That's a Muslim. It's not how much they prayed. No, that's between them and God. It's not how much they fasted. That's between them and Allah. It's not zakah. It's not hajj. A Muslim, his sign, her sign, is their care for other Muslims in terms of their granting safety from their tongue and their hand. Now, if there's a non-Muslim with us today, they're going to be like, I knew it. I knew those Muslims, they only look after each other. See, even their prophet is saying, Muslims look after other Muslims. 
They're, they're safe from their tongues and their hands, which means, it must mean that if you're not Muslim, if you're kuffar, then you can do, they're going to do whatever they want to us. And that's not the truth. Because if you stop there at the hadith, that's what it sounds like. But if you continue the words of the Prophet, and if you continue his teaching, you see it becomes very clear. So the next question is, See, we have as Muslims, we believe Islam, and above it is? Above Islam is? Iman, believing in God, being true to faith. So when you ask, what is Iman? He says it's to believe in Allah, to believe in the angels, to believe in the books, to believe in the messengers, to believe in the day of judgment, to believe in fate, it's good and bad. But when you ask the Prophet, who is a mu'min? Who is one who has faith? He doesn't say it's to believe in God and this and this and this. He says, Al-Mu'min. Man aminahu nas ala amwalihim wa anfusihim. A true believer is the one who all humanity and nas, men and women, believing and non-believing, good and bad, righteous and sinner. Al-Mu'min, a true believer, Man aminahu nas is he, is she, who all of humanity, irrespective of their conduct, find with them, with me, with you as a believer, safety from all harm for their property and their life and person. See, we forget this. You know, our Prophet ﷺ, he was the kind of guy who as people's intolerance increased, his mercy and compassion exponentially increased to absolve it. There's this famous story, you know, a Jewish man, the Prophet ﷺ borrowed money from him, he was a Jewish merchant, a, richest, a rich man. And the reason I mention is Jewish is because it's significant in this story. You know, if you're the Prophet of God and you came to another one of your followers and you said, hey, can I borrow money? People would try and say, like, even if I was to come to you and say, hey, can I have five pounds? You, uh, can I borrow it? I'll pay you back. And they're like, Sheikh, it's only five pounds. Please keep it. You'd feel, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask me back for it. So the Prophet subtly teaches us, you know, to have that izzah. Don't put people in an awkward situation. So he would ask someone completely outside his community who's not going to treat him that way. And he says, hey, do you mind if I borrow some money for you? I need to pay this, this, and this. So the man said yes. And a month, a month before the date of repayment, that man comes in front of the Prophet's assembly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the day of Jumu'ah, as the Prophet's on his member, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as he's speaking to his whole community, in his own masjid, with his own followers, that man comes into his own place and begins to abuse and ridicule and demand payment from the Prophet What kind of man are you? Give me back my money. Umar ibn al-Khattab, for those of you who know a little bit about Umar, he heard this and got, he stood up, I'm going to give, who's this guy who's speaking this way to our Prophet And the Prophet said, Da'hu ya Umar, let him go sit down. Akmil, continue. Fazdada jahlu, that man's ignorance increased. His ridicule of the Prophet increased. His vulgarity increased. And when he had nothing more to say, the Prophet said, you finished? He said, yes. The Prophet says to Umar, the same man from his companions who had reacted harshly, he said, stand up, go with this man, go with this merchant, and go to another one of them, another merchant, and ask for more money and pay this man his money back. And ask for a similar amount and give it to him as a gift on account of the hostility you showed him in my masjid. Umar and the man walk out, and Umar's furious. I'm going to give him a gift for cursing me. Ah, okay. The prophet, prophet ordered, what can I say? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As the man is walking out with Umar, he says, Ya Umar, atadri lima sana'ta hadha? Do you know why I did this? And Umar said, li'annaka aduullah. 
because you're an enemy of God. That's why you did this. You know, he's angry. The man said, no, I didn't do that because I'm an enemy of God. But I saw all of the signs of prophethood that we are ordered to recognize in our scripture on your prophet's eyes in them. He's honest, he's humble, he's diligent, he's... Except one. And the only way I could bring that one out was to do what I did. And Omar said, what's that one missing thing that you wanted to test and bring out? And he said, Every time the ridicule and the ignorance of the ignorant and fools speak ill, <coughs> Ill of him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of a prophet of God, their compassion increases to absolve it. And when he told you to pay me back my money, I said he's not a prophet of God. But when he told you to give me a gift, I say to you today, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and came to faith. Our Prophet وسلم, was that man. He's the one who taught the difference between Islam and Muslims, and the difference between believers and non-believers. He's the one that showed what trueness of faith means. Trueness of faith is that guarantee of safety and love and security and empathy to others, even those who are antagonistic, even those who push at us. And our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam distinguished himself time and time again. The second important teaching of a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Barakfiq, that I want you, you, know, you know, to focus on is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's interaction uh, you know, with those who loved him and cared for him. And when, you know, when, if I was to describe for you the Prophet Sallallahu love, for those who believed in him and their love for him, it can really be summed up in this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّلْ غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were harsh in your words and hard-hearted, these two qualities are never befitting a believer. You know, if you had resentment in your heart and you were quick with your tongue, even these companions, even Abu Bakr, even Umar, even Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'een, even those people that you and I cannot ever imagine that they would separate from him, Allah says that they would leave you and depart from you on account of those two qualities. And I want you to pause you and I for a second today. Because what good are the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu if they are not real and material in your life? I want you to take a second and just pause and see how close are we in modality and in nearness to that prophetic example. You know, it's easy to say, oh, I love the Prophet I said, I want to be on the Sunnah. It's another thing to say that the person who wronged me, I'm going to forgive them. See, a man asks the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want to have a place, you know, real estate. I want to own property in paradise. You know, I want to have a place in Jannah. And the Prophet says three things, sallallahu alayhi wa Three simple things to be said, but enormity, difficult things to actually put into practice. But they are the practice of the Prophet. What are these three simple things? Sil man qata'ak. Someone that you used to be friends with, that you've disconnected from. Reconnect with them, even if they connected you unjustly. Like, you know how sometimes you drift away from someone or someone's cut you out of their life <coughs> and it wasn't for any reason that you have done anything wrong? And it's almost as if your pride says, Who, why should I be the one to go to them? You know, I had a, a, there were two Muslim brothers, they were business partners, business went sour and they you know, had conflict with one another, and they asked me to sit between them you know, just to solve the problem. And afterwards, one of them says to me, Sheikh, I want you to, if I die, I want you to be the one who leads the prayers over my body. I said, you know, hey, may Allah give you a long life. Why are you talking like this, man? I don't want to leave no, you know, don't talk like that. He goes, no, 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 it's not, it's not for what you think. I want, I, I'm, I'm saying this to you so that you know that if I die, I want you to be the one that leads the prayers because if you see that guy, the one he had a bad problem in his business with, if you see that guy come into the masjid to pray over me, 
kick him out. <laughs> wow, that's some hatred, man. Like, <laughs> like even after I'm dead, I want to control this guy. Kick him out of the masjid. That's some blind hate. I said, Ya Allah. You know, the Prophet said, Sil man qata'ak. And second, wa'afu amman zalamak. Forgive the one who oppressed you. You know, with all the oppression that happens in the world, and I don't want you to mistake this, that when we say, you know, forgive the one who oppressed you, it means let him do it to you again. No. Take precaution so you don't get harmed again. But in your heart is the capacity to forgive someone for having wronged you in life. Do not ever be of those who have that intolerance in their heart that they could never ask God to pardon the mistake of the one who has committed it against them. You know, you know sometimes we, we, we stand in front of Allah and we say, Allahumma ghfir li ya Rabb, oh Allah forgive me. And then your friend rings you up and says, listen, I'm sorry I did this. You say, I'll never forgive you. I'll hate you forever. And then you turn and say, Allahumma ghfir lana warhamna wa subhalayna, right? It's this blind, you know, it's, it's a complete step away from what are the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. And the essence of the Prophet's teachings is that, that concept that yes, even if someone has wronged you, you have the capacity to overlook their fault and give them the haq that they deserve and manage yourself in a way that you won't bring yourself to disrepute or harm through them again but that in my heart I'm at peace between myself and Allah, knowing that what has harmed me was meant, and what, has, uh, what was not received of me was meant by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and no one is in control of anything greater than Allah the Most High. So those are the genuine teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, essential teachings for our days and our times, you know, in the times uh, of these uh, stressful moments that we live in today. I want to shift to another section of his teachings, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at times when we think of the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I want you to know it's not linear. You know, it's not one dimensional, it's not one and two and three and four. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's teachings, they were so coherent and comprehensive that they covered all of the dictates of life. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on as Muslims that the Prophet even taught us, you know, bedroom relations, you know, the dua that we make and, uh, you know, uh, how we make wudu and how we take a shower and which hand we eat with. You know, these kind of things, they're not just mundane issues. These are things that earn a spiritual blessing with Allah if our intention is correct. So I want you to see the Prophet's totality and framework of, of, of leading us to good. And one of the things that I think that escapes us as Muslims at times when we look at the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that we overlook his personal conduct in his personal relationship just between him and Allah. And just like as we are individuals between ourselves and Allah, so was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like there's these moving passages in the Quran where Allah says, Qul, say to them, Inni, I, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allaha Mukhlisan Lahuddin. Tell them I've been ordered and commanded to be from those who submit to Allah with complete and utter sincerity. Qul, say to them, Inni akhafu in asaytu Rabbi Adaba Yawmin Azim, that I fear if I, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, disobey my Lord the punishment of a terrifying day. Qul, Say to them, say to them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, those, those verses to me are astounding. The humanness of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's this one, uh, you know, hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led the prayer and it was Asr. And instead of it being four rak'ah, he prayed it five. Instead of it being four, he prayed it five rak'ah. He made a mistake, he forgot how many rak'ah that he had already done. And none of the Sahaba said anything. Abu Bakr is behind it. You know, all these Sahaba, they're praying with the Prophet ﷺ. He did five instead of four. And he, you know, started doing a dhikr. And then one of them says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ, uh, when I go lead my, my family now, should I do it five? Like, has the prayer changed to five? And the Prophet said, what are you talking about? What do you mean five? 
They said, well, you know, just the prayer, you did it five, and you know, normally you do it four, but. So I turned to him and he said, why didn't any of you correct me? Innama ana bashar. I'm only a human being. Ansa kama tansaw. I'm forgetful and prone to forgetfulness, just like you. Now that, that hadith astounds me, the humanness of the Prophet ﷺ. His capacity, yes, to make a mistake in that sense. It's a learning journey for those who are with him. That's how we learn how to correct the mistakes of salah. But it, it shows you the humanness of the Prophet ﷺ and his humility before us. That he says, I forget just like you forget, I'm only a human being. Say to them, I was ordered and, and commanded to worship God. Say to them, I am fearful of the wrath and the punishment of Allah if I do what's wrong. And you hear in Surah Al-Baqarah, in the third last verse of the Surah, Amen al-Rasul. The Prophet demonstrated belief and faith. Wal-Mu'minun, and we, the believers, we learn it from him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I want you to reflect on the personal endeavors of the Prophet ﷺ between him and Allah. And when you look at the humility he had before Allah, it puts you in awe of Allah. And that's the reason I share these moments with you. The aim of the Prophet ﷺ in his worship of Allah as an individual is to set that standard for you and I that when we stand before Allah in prayer, it's us with him. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, that whenever the Prophet was at home, he was in our service. He was always with doing whatever, you know, he was involved in everything. But when the time of prayer came, it's like he doesn't know us, we don't know him. It's like, I don't know who, who are you? I'm standing now before Allah. And how needy we are of developing that kind of relationship with Allah where there are things about Allah that you and I need to grow within us. And we need to look ourselves in the mirror and say, what am I negligent in regards in my relationship with Allah? What are the things that I'm missing? You know, alhamdulillah, I'm good in this, 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 and this, but I need to improve in this. And there's no better place to start than prayer. And therefore, in that intimate teaching of the Prophet ﷺ, he's asked, what are the most beloved deeds by God? What is the best action that a person can perform? And he responds simply, As-salatu ala waqtiha. Pray in its right time. And I want to use the concept of salah as that essential teaching of the Prophet ﷺ for the believers. The last words, I want you, you know, I want you to think of this. The last words uttered by the Prophet ﷺ before his death in public lecture to his community, to the Ummah, was <coughs> as salah, as salah. Your prayers, your prayers. There's not a single one of us in this room, me and you, there's not a single one of us who will listen to this later online except that they can improve their prayer. If there is one thing that you can do today that will change the quality of your life forever is doing your prayer better. The worst day of your life is going to begin on a day that you missed Fajr. Like the day you have the worst disaster, I guarantee you it'll be a day that you've been negligent in Salah. That's just how, it, that's just how life is. So the more you ensure that connection with Allah, that sila with Allah, that personal connection, here you have the Prophet saying, I've been ordered to, f f to pray. I've been ordered to submit. I'm just a human just like you. I fear of that day. What was the thing that he emphasized the most? What was the thing he did the most? The Sahaba, they would look at him and they would say, Ya Rasulullah you pray so much that your feet have swollen. And he says, Shouldn't I, should I not be thankful? When they told him that you've already been forgiven. For you and I, we don't know that we're forgiven. So we need to pray more and pray better because we don't know that. But he who knows he was forgiven, he still prayed. Because should I not be a thankful servant of Allah? I conclude with a final last glimpse of the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is the Prophet in his time of, you know, convenience and relaxation with his family. 
uh, you know, there's these statements about the Prophet Sallallahu that um, at times when we read them, we kind of misunderstand them. And I shared a little bit of them earlier today when I was talking about the beauty of the Prophet's love for his wife, uh, wife Aisha radiallahu anha. But I, I, I want to use two examples of just what the Prophet normally did, because there's this misconceived notion that the Prophet, you know, he was going from the Battle of Badr to the Battle of Uhud, and then the conquest of Mecca, and it's almost as if like that's his whole life. But really, in totality, the Prophet Sallallahu the thing that he did the most was be a good husband, and be a good father, and be a good Imam. Like he did the mundane things in life well for Allah. You know, there's, uh, this incident where the Prophet Sallallahu he was at home and he was sewing. And you know, we all know these hadith, oh yeah, the Prophet used to mend his own clothes. But we don't see kind of like the background of it. So the Prophet was sewing something, but he's not good at sewing. You know, he doesn't do it well. And it was a hot day and he was concentrating and he was sweating, you know, because he's concentrating and it's hot. And Aisha, his wife, she's sitting across the room, she's amused by this. She's like watching him from a distance, like my wife would do to me, like when she sees me struggling. Women are like that. And she's just got this big smile on her face. And she's looking at him, she doesn't say anything to him, she's just watching him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then finally, you know, almost as if you could see it in frustration, he puts his head up and he sees her, that she's got this grin on her face. And he says, ma biki ya Aisha? Aisha, what's wrong? Are you laughing at me? She said, La wallahi ya Rasulullah. No, walakinni tadhakkartu abiyata aba hudayn. No, 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 no. I'm not laughing at you, but I remember these verses of poetry of this pre Islamic poet where he said that the drops of sweat on your forehead are more precious to me than the emeralds and the pearls. And when I saw, when I remembered those things, I saw your face and I said, That is absolutely true. And the Prophet ﷺ walked over to her, kissed her on the forehead and said, Wallahi, anti akhtharu min, uh, uh, akhtharu li min thalika ya Aisha. You're even more to me than that. You know, that glimpse of the Prophet Sallallahu domestic life, that just fleeting moment, kind of gives you a little bit of a perspective of his humanness. And if there's anything that we need to show to ourselves, our, our families, our community, and those outside our community today, is the humanness of our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I'm going to leave you with a mission of fulfilling three things. I, I ask you, inshallah, to fulfill these three things. First, to increase your mention of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want you, you know, when I was in Medina, and I said this earlier today, I was saying it to the brothers, that when you're in Medina and you give your salawat upon the Prophet, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, and, and you're like literally, you know, 10, 10 feet away from his resting place, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it feels a little bit different. But it's actually as therapeutic for you and I that we're so many thousands of kilometers away that in your heart you still connect to him. And your connection with the Prophet of Allah is not one of physical proximity. So connect with him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Never will you increase his mention except that Allah will increase your mention. Never will you send peace and blessings upon him, except Allah will send upon you 10. Never will you mention him, except Allah will mention you, and that the angels will carry your name. Never will you mention him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, except your salah will be displayed to him, and he will come to know of you, and it makes you from those who are worthy of his shafa'ah and intercession on the day of judgment. So I ask you to increase your salah upon the Prophet ﷺ at all times and in all circumstances, whether you're getting on a bus and walking to school or going to class, just mention him sallallahu alayhi wasallam and ask Allah to provide for him the choices, blessings of peace and blessings sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Number two, I ask you inshaAllah to connect to his teachings on a more spiritual level, not just on a books, book and page level. Don't just read, you know, the Martin Ling's biography or al rahiq al-Makhtoum or, and it's just like a story. But I want you to look inside and see what is applicable in your life. 
you know, see the incidents that some of which we mentioned of the Prophet ﷺ's compassion, and then look into your life and see where compassion is lacking and where it can be increased. See what, you know, what relationships that you had that should have been salvaged and see what abandonment of other that you should reclaim and see, you know, what standing you have before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what increase in your prayer is made worthy, will make you worthy before Allah on the day of judgment. And third and finally, I ask you inshallah to become a conduit of good where you let other people connect with the Prophet ﷺ simply on the basis of their interaction with you. Like simply that someone met you and references the good you've given them, not to yourself or your upbringing, but to your Islam and to your Iman. Like let Iman speak for who you are. You're no longer just, you know, a, a, a history student, but you're a Muslim history student. You're no longer, you know, a, a doctor, but you're a good Muslim doctor. And the greatest qualities that you possess in life should, dis, should be displayed on account of why you display them. And your honesty and your diligence and your punctuality and your charitableness and your, your genuineness and your full spirit. It's not just because of who I am or what my parents taught me, but why they taught me that and why I possess those ideals, why I adorn myself with the beauty of hijab, why I'm a person who walks out of lecture to fulfill Salatul Jumu'ah, why I do these things is because it makes me noble. And that nobility comes from my submission to God. And let people know that Islam is valuable in your life and brings peace and stability and balance in your life as it did for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions and as it will do for generations that will come after us insha'Allah. So reference your faith in all of the good, but equally be on guard that with that same rationale and reasoning that people may reference your unfaithfulness, your dishonesty, your lack of empathy and humility, your uncharitableness, your abusiveness, not just to you, but also they may reference it to your faith and to Islam. And therefore a Muslim, and it's not fair, it's not fair that a Muslim's deeds are judged and the brush that is used to paint them paints all those who say and are named with their name. But that's the world that we live in today and it's something that we must take that as a very real, real trueness of, 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 of weight on our shoulders. That a person doesn't just look at me and my beard or my hijab or my name Muhammad or Ahmed or Yahya. They don't just look at it as individual, but they broadcast and project from that on anyone else that they meet. So it's your duty to represent your Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the best and, and, and greatest quality. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has gathered us from our different places and our different time zones uh, in this assembly where we seek to mention the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he joins us with him in Jannatul Firdaus, Allahumma Ameen. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns those of you who are international students back to your homelands with an acquired level of knowledge and honor and skill that will make you and your families and your nations proud. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses those of you who are domestic students and locals with insight into the affairs of your country, the wonderful United Kingdom, that you can become leaders in it and examples of righteousness and pillars of morality. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with Iman that does not depart from your heart and then actions that adorn you and that you are from those who are al-fa'izin, the successful in this worldly life and in the hereafter. I pray that we are drawn nearer and closer ever to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he is from those who will intercede for us on the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen. And I pray that you forgive me for our lateness today and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your patience and, and staying back to honor me in this regard. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayh. Thank you for taking your time to be with me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
the fame.